Good morning and welcome to Thorn Creek Church this morning. So good to see each and every one of you here. And I also want to welcome all those who are watching online and hope that you really feel a part of us this morning as we worship together. Um, Psalm 95 says, Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. So that's what we're here for this morning, to worship. But let us stand right now and let us sing to the great God that we have.
faithful now. You are faithful in all of our circumstances and how we thank you. In every season of our life, Lord, that you walk beside us. No matter what we are going through, Lord, you are there. Even when we have reasons to doubt, help us to know, Lord, and to trust you that you are with us at all times. We confess, Lord, that sometimes we walk away from you. Sometimes we just go about our lives and we don't even, we just kind of ignore you and don't realize that you are there. But because you are so faithful, you do not turn away from us. But you welcome us back with open arms. So thank you, Lord. We stand here this morning, Lord, and we worship you for the great God that you are. Help us to trust you in all things and help us to know deep in our, in our souls and in our hearts how much we need you each and every hour of each and every day. That you are what we need to go through this life, to have peace and comfort and strength in all things. We praise you, Lord God. We praise you, Jesus, for all you have done. In Jesus' name alone, amen. You may be seated. Candy will come up for the children's sermon. We're going to sing one more song, Lord, I Need You. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. <clears throat> anyway, good morning. I brought a number of things with today. Let me pull them out of my bag a minute. I brought with five little rocks. Believe me, there's five of them in here, and they're dirty. And then I brought a slingshot. I really should have had Aaron demonstrate this rather than me. But let's see here. Basically, we hold it like this. No, I'm not going to 
to Tarasca. All right, then. I do want to talk to you about uh, David and Goliath. I figured you figured that out by now. There's a story of David and Goliath, and it was about the Philistines and Israel who were having a war. The Philistines were very strong and very mighty. The Israelites were really getting scared. And then the Philistines brought out what they thought was their secret weapon. A huge giant, taller and stronger than anything they had ever seen. They didn't know what they were going to do. And then along came a young boy, maybe about eight or nine years old. He was a shepherd boy named David. He believed and trusted in the Lord. He knew he could do anything with the Lord's help. So he picked up the five rocks. He picked up his slingshot. He went to the king and he said, I'll fight the giant. The king and the Israelites laughed. You're just a little kid. How can you fight the giant? The king said no. Finally, though, the king said, okay, if David wore all of the king's armor. David said no. He wasn't trusting in himself or others. Only with the Lord's help would he be able to knock out the giant. He then took his five rocks and his slingshot he prayed and asked for the Lord's help. Then he trusted, and he shared with all the Israelites and the Philistines the greatness of God by knocking out the giant. So, at home, here in church, at work, everywhere, do you have giants to knock out? You know, I had some that I thought of that maybe we, we all have thought of at some time or another. The first one I thought of was about losing someone you love or something you love, like maybe a pet. That hurts. That's scary. Next, it's bad people. Those who really want to bully you, they kind of scare me. And then I absolutely dislike being embarrassed. Maybe you do too. You feel bad about something you said or did and, uh, or something that was said about you or to you. You're embarrassed. That's scary too. Or being lost. I don't like not knowing where I'm at. And when I was a kid, and I'm sure many of you kids get a little scared when you can't find mom and dad or not having friends to sit by you or play with you, or getting hurt and falling and scraping your knee. Some of us are even afraid of the dark because it's scary not to be able to see when there is no light. I think a lot of kids, Christian kids, moms and dads, Christian moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas, find their giant to be how to share the story of Jesus. Even though Jesus says in the Bible, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In simpler words, that simply says, don't be afraid. The Lord, my Father, sent me, Jesus. And so now I will be with you, sending you. So, we need to knock out the giants in our life. And I actually made one here. He's kind of creepy. And on top, all around, I wrote the things that I had thought of. This is something you can do at home. You could blow up a balloon and write your fears on it. And then, we need to do what David did. We need to speak and take action. The very first thing we need to do is pray for the Lord's help. 
Let's go ahead and do that. Lord, help us get rid of our giants. Give us a heart like David. Be our defense so we can face our giants with confidence. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now that we've and show them about Jesus. That's all right. Take your time. I have a, a better slingshot of him on it. You know a good slingshot if it's got the, the, the wrist guard thing, you know, because that's, yeah. Although I do think that you could have actually slingshotted M&Ms into the crowd and you know, <laughs> some kind of candy. Um, so there are going to be a few announcements that are kind of mixed through this message, but... Uh, I, I need you to do one thing, and this is going to seem a little odd to you, but I, I want to invite you, whether you are here in home, here, here, here in the church, or rabbi's students, the disciples of a rabbi would actually go watch them. This is a little strange. But they would, you know, they'd be there when they go to the bathroom and they would watch how they wash their hands. Oh, because that's the way I'm supposed to wash my hands. I'm supposed to do everything the way my rabbi did it. And Jesus was their rabbi. And he knows he's going to die. And he knows that he's been betrayed. And he knows that they're coming to arrest him. And he has talked to them. And then he begins to pray. And he prays for himself in John 17. He prays for his disciples. And then in verse 20, he turns the corner. And I want you to think about this for a second. In verse 20, he's been praying for his disciples. He says this, My prayer is not for them alone, not just for the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Wait a minute. Let's stop there before we even go on. Praying for all that will believe in Christ and the gospel because of the message of the disciples. You know who he's praying for? He's praying for you and for me. He's praying for us, saying, "My, I have a prayer for them. And, you know, I think that's important for us to say, wow, not only is this what Jesus taught, but this is what Jesus wanted for me. If there's any place in the Bible that you can absolutely, without question, clearly know this is what Jesus wanted and wants for me as an individual, this is it. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I, may self, uh, I myself may be in them. Let's pray. Lord, um, as we open your word today, we pray that our hearts and minds would be open. Lord, some of us came here this morning desperately needing to be encouraged. Some of us came here uh, desiring to be challenged and to be called. And, and all of us are here because on some sense we believe that you are the answer. And so, Lord, we pray that you would uh, 
Speak to us. We pray that you would teach us. We pray that you would shape us. And Lord, we pray that our hearts and minds would be open and that we would be different people because we were here, that we would be more like what you intend for us to be, what you call us to be and to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you've been um, around for the last few weeks, you know that we've been looking at our new vision, vision statement, which is this idea that we believe that Thorn Creek Reformed Church is called to make disciples of the people we live with, we work with, and we play with. Now, we're still, there's still a lot of things that are kind of being hammered out about what that means and how that's going to apply. And somewhere in the coming months, we'll do an official kickoff. You know, we'll be like, hey, here's our new thing. And, you know, it's, but I, what I want you to understand is that this isn't something new, okay? Some of you know that there used to be five words up here that started with C's. And some of you are like, what, we're not doing that anymore? But let's stop for a second as we dig into the Scripture and think about those five words. Now, our new statement is we are called to make disciples of those we live with, work with, and play with. It's, it's found, it, the foundation is found in Matthew 28 that says, go and make disciples. Well, think about this for a second. The first one of the five C's was celebrate God's presence. Well, we have already discovered and discussed and affirmed the fact that what we do on Sunday morning when we celebrate God's presence, when we worship together, that is foundational in what it means to make disciples. So we already know that that's not a sea that's gone away. We are still going to celebrate God's presence. The second C was communicate the power of Jesus. Well, that's kind of a foundational piece of making disciples too. If we want to make disciples of somebody that doesn't know Jesus, the first thing we need to do is communicate to them about the power of Jesus. The next one is connect to each other. And you're like, well, what does that have to do with making disciples? Well, we're going to talk later in the sermon this morning. Somebody finish this sentence for me. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Jesus was very convinced that one of the most powerful statements we have is not our doctrine, although that's important. It's not our singing, although that's important. It's not our building, although that's important. Jesus said the thing that people will know that will really empower your message is if you love one another. And I tell you, I've seen that happen. Haven't you seen that happen? When somebody goes through a hard time and the church gets behind them and walks with them and supports them and encourages them. And the people outside look at that and say, wow, I wish I had a group, a family, a body, some people that love me the way that your church loves you. So we are still committed to connecting to each other. The, fifth, the fourth C was commit to growing. Well, making disciples, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. It's very clear that when we talk about making disciples, we are talking about a commitment to growing and teaching and learning, and not just head learning, but our lives being shaped. And the last C was commission to serve. Well, that's kind of the whole basis of the, of the conversation, right? Right? We believe that Thorn Creek Reformed Church, oh, wait, that's us, is called to make disciples. In other words, we are commissioned to serve in this way. I want to say that because as we wrestle with this, I don't want you to think, oh, remember the old days? In fact, I spent some time this week looking through some of the historical books from Thorn Creek Reformed Church, and I am absolutely convinced that from day one of First Reformed Church of Roseland, where we came as a church, if you had said to the elders, do you think that this church is called to make disciples of the people we live with, 
and work with and play with? They would have been absolutely. If you'd said to them, for the next 170 years, are we going to do that well? They would have said, I hope so. That's why we're here. And if you'd said, and then at 170 years, are we going to kind of stop? They would have said, no, 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 no. We want to do this until the Lord returns. So I, I just want to point that out because um, as we talk about those things, I don't want you to think that this is new. Now, the way we do it might be new. I mean, I'm pretty confident that the, oh, I, I forget his name, the first pastor of First Reformed Church of Roseland wasn't wearing this microphone thing here. Um, and I guarantee you there weren't padded pews. Count your blessings. And there probably wasn't air conditioning. How many of you remember when you were a kid, you had the, the, the little fan made out of cardboard, and it usually had a funeral home on it? Yeah, I don't know why that was, but there's a funeral home ad, and, and you would fan yourself because the church didn't have air conditioning. I'm aging myself when I tell you that, but that was the way it was. Things have changed. In fact, somebody tell me, did First Reformed Church of Roseland start worship in English or in Dutch? It was Dutch at that point, right? So I'm now going to preach the rest of the message in Dutch. <laughs> the point is, the way we do it is going to change, but what we are called by God to do is still the same. And we are called to make disciples of the people we live with, work with, and play with. Now, two weeks ago, I talked about the people we live with, and that was kind of easy to talk about, really, because we all have that sense that, yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make disciples in our family. And then last week, we talked about making disciples of the people we work with, and that was a little harder because, you know, it's hard to know in our society. How do you walk that line? You know, I've... I've worked at a couple Christian-owned businesses in my life, and I know that the, the owners of those business struggled with, how do I encourage the Christians that work here, but still not make the people that aren't Christians feel kind of weird about that? And it's just hard. But this week, I'm supposed to talk about making disciples of the people we play with. Now, I like that, because our society is very into play, right? I mean, whatever age you are, you have people that you play with, probably, you know, and maybe they are the same people you live with and you work with, but maybe you have people you play golf with. You know, as a, over the last 20 years of my life, one of the ways that has played itself out has been as a, a sports dad, you know? I, I'm help, I was helping coach my kids in their sports, and I'm getting to know these other kids, and I'm getting to know their parents, and I, I had to ask myself as a Christian, how do I help them to know this Jesus? Now, it's hard because the Bible doesn't talk specifically about that. It's also hard because, let's be honest, one of the hardest places sometimes to live out your faith is in the passion of competition, right? You know, I was asked to go play golf with a few members of this congregation last Sunday. I haven't played with them yet, but um, I hope you realize that if you golf with a pastor, you know, you can't use golf language because we all know how that worked out, right? I, I remember sitting in the crowd at a basketball game between two Christian high schools, and at this basketball game, all of a sudden I realized that the people in that room that were most likely to not know the gospel were probably the referees. And it was an intense, vicious basketball game. And the crowd was yelling. And I asked myself this question. If that referee, both those refs, if they are forming their opinion and their impression of what Christianity is from this crowd, what are they deciding? It's kind of hard to talk about that. 
You know, and maybe you have people that you travel with, that you vacation with, that you do fun things with. And sometimes, let's face it, a lot of us kind of have softer rules for when you're traveling, right? And I remember once showing up at a church where I was going to be the youth pastor, and they said, now, now we don't ever go out to eat. We don't want on Sundays. We don't want you to ever take our kids out to eat on Sundays. And they said, because we don't do that. But then I learned there was a kind of mumbled um, postlude to that statement. We don't go out to eat on Sundays unless we're at the cottage in Michigan. Now, I'm not talking about Sundays and what you do on Sundays. What I'm talking about is the fact that what it means to live out your faith when you're playing is hard. And what I found as I dug through scriptures is that honestly, the things that we think we're supposed to focus on are, usually aren't the right things. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, I like getting involved, you know, traveling with people and, and spending time with them because it gives us a chance for me to tell them what I believe. That's important, but that's not what Jesus talked about primarily. Or people would say, oh, you know, I, I, uh, they'll, they'll be able to see that I don't use that kind of language. I don't swear like that. And now, again, I think that's a good thing to say, let my language, what, what comes out of my mouth, be a reflection of Jesus. But think about that for a second. Is that usually people say, wow, he didn't swear. I'm going to turn to Jesus now. I mean, it's part of our witness, but it's not going to turn hearts. Jesus is praying for us in this passage, and what he says is, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In fact, it's interesting because he says two things. He says, um, my prayer is for them, talking about the believers, and why does it say? that they may be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In verse 23, it says, May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. In other words, twice in a couple verses here, Jesus says, I want them to be one, not just so they can all get along and they can all decide together what color the carpet's supposed to be, not so they can all get along and have a nice time in the gym after service when the pandemic's over and we can do that again. He says, I want them to be one. I want them to be unified so that the world will know about Jesus. And I don't think we talk about that very much because it's kind of scary. And it, honestly, it's kind of convicting. So what is this unity that Jesus is talking about in this passage? What's it look like? Well, if you look at it, it says, May they be one just as you are in me and I am in you. In other words, the model is Jesus and the Father. We're supposed to be one, you and I, the same way that Jesus and the Father are one. Now, let's face it, that's a goal that we're never going to make it to. But that's the goal we're striving to. It's that kind of unity. Now, that's not uniformity. It doesn't mean we all have to kind of dress the same and talk the same and walk the same and cheer for the same teams. and, And, you know, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean we all have to have the same preferences. It doesn't mean that somehow we have to have cookie-cutter Christians that all look the same. And I don't think it's also talking about an institution like, oh, we all need to have one worldwide church where we all agree with one denomination because I think we all know that even a denomination can be divided. What he's talking about here is a unity of the heart. It's a unity of purpose. That's why it says twice, may they be one that the world may know. It's a unity of of passion where they have set some priorities. Now, so what does he say that we're supposed to let the world know? That you sent me. I I heard a pastor say this week um, in a video I was watching, he said, you know what? 
I never want to assume that everybody has the gospel clear in their mind. He said, because what if somebody comes to church one day? You know, they have a neighbor that's been working on them forever, and finally they come to church one day, and I'm preaching about how to be a good dad, and I tell them all about how to be a good dad, but if I don't make it clear that the gospel is about Jesus and, and his death on the cross to pay for our sins, then what I've done is I have missed the one opportunity to, make, to let them know the gospel. So what is it that we're supposed to be let people know we're supposed to let people know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life that every time we say those words we should never allow ourselves to lose the passion and the vision and the excitement did you hear that for God so loved the world that includes you that includes you that includes you that includes you every one of us for God so loved the world that he gave his only son i mean he gave his only son do you hear that he had a son and Jesus left the comfort of heaven to walk among us. And I know that we're going through a hard time in our society right now, but do you understand what life was like in first century Palestine? I mean, he became a person. And he suffered and struggled and he was tempted, the scripture says, in every way we were. And then he intentionally lived his life in such a way that he modeled for us and he showed us what it meant, meant to live the way God wants us to live. But then he said, I'm going to live my life in such a way that I end up at the cross and I, have, I am whipped until I'm basically a human hamburger and I am then nailed to a tree with railroad spikes through my hand. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's the message we have for the world. A lot of you know that I don't really, I, I don't do very well with sermon titles because I never know what the point is. But this, the title of this sermon is Christ-Centered Eccentricity. And the reason I use that word eccentricity is that what we are talking about here, unity, not conformity, not identical opinions and attitudes and everything else, but unity. How many of you think, you know, our society is very unified right now? No. In fact, if you talk to anybody, they will tell you that this is probably, since the Civil War, the most divided that our nation has been at any one time. Every pastor I have talked to in the last six months would say that we are so divided right now. We're divided by the pandemic. We're divided by politics. We're divided by whether or not you should wear a mask. We are just divided, divided by our opinions about race and how we should deal with that. We are split up from each other. And the reality is, is that unity is, ex is, is eccentric now. I looked up the word eccentric. Eccentric literally means deviating from the common or customary character. Peculiar. Odd. In this world now, unity is a deviation from the common or customary character. It's peculiar. It's odd. Now, for this next thing, I need four volunteers. And um, you might as well just volunteer and come on up. I need, I need a couple people. Don't worry, you will actually be social distancing on the stage here. I need four volunteers. Come on. Come on. Okay, Mark, come on up. Um, and, and it can be kids, it can be, okay, there we go, four. So what I want you guys to do, normally if we wanted to symbolize unity, we might have four people come up and stand in a circle, but now we have to social distance. So I want you to have ropes. You take a rope and 
Okay, and, and kind of, I want you to get in a circle and um, using those ropes to maintain social distance. The ropes are about eight or nine feet long, so you're, you're plenty of, apart from each other, you know. Um, all right. Now we got one extra rope. That will come into play later. All right. So this, what God intended for us was for us to be unified to be attached to each other. I'm going to, you, you guys can you just kind of step back for a second, and we're going to use you as a visual thing. But maintain your six feet here. Okay. All right. So, these ropes, this is the gospel. In fact, I made these longer than six feet so you could do this. I want you to kind of wrap the end of the rope around your hand. So if I were to, you know, if I were to, yeah, if I were to kind of try to pull it away, you wouldn't let me. Now, normally, we wouldn't be this far apart. You know, normally, we don't live our lives as separate as we do right now. But we're separated. But we're tied together by the gospel. Now, you're like, what's the point? Well, the problem is that we live in a society that is not tied together, right? I mean, we live in a, in a society where everything is trying to divide us. And there are all kinds of things that try to divide us. I don't know if you realize this, but we are heading towards baseball playoffs that could hypothetically result in a World Series between the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox. Talk about division. In fact, I want you to know now, Cubs fans, I'm sorry. Second isn't so bad. Um, anyway, um, but you know, what are some of the other things that divide us right now? If this is the gospel that's tying us together, what are the things that are trying to break this, this bond? Well, masks. Oh, should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Come on. Okay, are masks important enough to divide us, to, to separate the connection that we have in the gospel. Are masks that important? No. Another thing that divides us, and this is really crucial in our society right now. We have an election coming up. You probably haven't heard much about it. But Christians and entire churches are fighting. No, we're not just talking about disagreeing. We're talking about division, about people that will not come to church in some places. And I'm glad that I don't know of anybody like that here. They won't come to church because those people support Joe Biden or those people support Donald Trump. And there are people writing entire books about why no Christian could ever vote for Joe Biden if you're a true Christian. And there are people that are writing entire books that say you could never vote for Donald Trump if you're a Christian. Now, I think voting is important, and I think this election really matters, but are we going to allow, as the Church of Jesus Christ, voting and who we vote for to divide us when the gospel binds us together? No. Now, there are things that matter. You know, there's a lot of argument about the whole, you know, the, the phrase black lives matter. But we need to differentiate within the church between the organization black lives matter and the statement black lives matter. There are some things about the organization black lives matter that, that I, I think are actually in opposition to the gospel. The organization. But can you be a Christian and not agree that black lives matter? It matters. I mean, and yet people want to cut through this. People are arguing about all kinds of things. Within our denomination, there's a major division, and you're going to hear more about that, more than we probably want to in the next six months or a year and my question is, can we let that divide us when the gospel binds us together? No. In fact, you know what? Ultimately, and 
I know you guys are like, how long am I going to stand here? <laughs> the only way this connection can fail is if we choose to let go of the things that bind us together. If we choose to let go of the things of the gospel that binds us together. And that's why I do want to ask you as we read this about unity, do you have a broken relationship in this church or with any Christian? Let's take it beyond Thorn Creek Reformed Church. Do you have a, a Christian brother or sister that you have a broken relationship with? Scripture is really clear. In fact, Jesus says, if, if you are coming to the altar and you realize that your brother has something against you, put it down, your sacrifice, and go Make it right. Now, I want to do one more thing, and I want to, actually, I'm going to, I want to move this so you guys can see this clearly. All right. So, um, it's interesting. If you ask four people to do what you guys did, they will always do this, and they're facing in. But we could be bound together facing out, right? In fact, let's do that. Flip your ropes around. There we go. Part of the problem in the church of Jesus Christ is that we have spent most of our time bound together and looking inward. You know what happens when you look inward? Yeah. When I was a, in youth ministry, one of the things that was always terrifying to me was when two people in the youth group were like, we're going to go to college and room together. Because sometimes that works, but sometimes somebody that you enjoy a little bit becomes a little difficult when you live with them. It never happened, of course, with Julie and I, but some couples, when they get married, realize, wow, they have some things about them. This man or this woman has some things that I don't really find all that interesting sometimes, or I find kind of annoying. Again, not us, other couples. Um, we can talk later if you need some counseling. But um, that's what happens when we spend our time looking in. But you know what happens when we spend our time looking out? All of a sudden, we are bound together, but we see the world around us. We see the people that we live with, or that we work with, that we play with. And we see the fact that we live in a world where more than 2 billion people have never even heard the name of Jesus. And we're sitting here in circles sometimes picking at each other and saying, well, you're not dressed appropriately for church. Yeah, well, two billion people don't know about Jesus. What's more important? We need to think about this. Now, there's one other problem. I'm going to, I didn't tell you, no, I'm not going to do this to Julie. I'll do this to Justin because I don't want Julie to be mad at me. Justin can be mad. Justin, come on. Come on. Let's say that Justin is another person. And um, he wants to know about Jesus. And so he hears about the gospel. Hmm. There's really not a place for you, is there, Justin? So if we wanted to make a place for Justin, how would we do that? Now, I want you to think about that. Somebody would have to be a little farther from one of their primary friends. Somebody might say, but, but I want to be with this person. I want to be. But you know what's cool about that? Is that if you are willing to let go of the rope, which is what Jesus did when he came to earth, right? He was in heaven with the Father. Equality with God, Philippians 2 says, he let go of that. To reach hands out to other people. You see, that's what the scripture is talking about it when he says, you know what? Let's be one in a way that will allow us 
to let go of the rope. So I want to ask you, in our unity, which I think we do okay, but I, I want to talk for a second to those of you who are at home. It's hard to be connected when you're at home, and I get that. There are a lot of people that need to be at home, but we want you to know that we miss you. We understand, but we miss you. And so what some of us that are in this room need to do is we need to get on the phone or on the computer or we need to do something to connect with the people that are at home because some of them are feeling like this. And they need somebody to reach out and to love them. I mean, we already have the gospel in common, but we need to be willing to reach out. And those of you at home, you know, I, I talked to somebody this week who said to me that one of the turning points for them, even though they're pretty severely quarantined, is when they began to say, okay, what's my ministry during quarantine? Okay, you guys can set down, let down the rope. And you guys can sit down. Thanks. Give them a hand. Yay. Jesus said, if they are one, the world will see. I don't want to really go there right now, but Philippians chapter 1, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and he says, live your life in a way that is, you know, worthy of the gospel. And then he says an interesting thing. He says, that way, even if we're not together, I will know that you're living out the gospel and that we will be one, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Even though we're apart, he says we can be together in the gospel. I think that's a crucial verse, Philippians 1.27. But the other verse I just want to touch on this morning is 1 Peter chapter 2. And... Um, in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 9, we're not going to go through all these. Peter's writing and he says this. You are a chosen people. I want to remind you, it's not because of anything you did. Not because God loved you more than your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. What was a priest in the Old Testament and in Jesus' day? A priest was the person that stood between the people and God and connected them to God. And Peter's saying, the Bible is saying, hey, you're a royal priesthood. Your job is to stand between people and God. Your job is to stand between the people that you play with and God. And to stand there with a hand extended or maybe a rope extended. I haven't decided what the best way to explain that is. A royal priesthood. What would happen this week if you offered the rope to somebody? A holy no nation, which is interesting because a holy nation, mostly he's talking there about being forgiven. You've been forgiven, you know that? I've, I've heard... Um, that there are some things that people are really struggling with, that people are struggling because they're home alone and we're divided from each other. People are feeling immense guilt because they don't have other people to help them deal with it. He says, you're a holy nation belonging to God. If you feel isolated right now, hear that. You belong to God. You belong to God. God, in the midst of this isolation and this quarantine, is with you at home right now. And there is no more God in this sanctuary than there is in your living room at home. Because God is fully present. The Holy Spirit is there, which is crazy thought, isn't it? But it's true. And it says that we, you may declare the praises of him who called you out. In other words, you are a people 
so that other people can know about Jesus. You are a people a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a chosen belonging to God because God, the heart of God wants people to know about Jesus. Now, I want to ask one last question here as we close up because talking about unity and evangelism is really hard in the midst of a pandemic, right? I mean, some of you have people that you work with that you were praying for and maybe you were spending time starting to talk to them about the gospel and now you haven't seen them in six months. That's hard. It's, it's kind of like we as a church had a, a destination. The transition team and the consistory were saying, okay, we're going here. This is what we're going to do. This is who we're going to become. And it's like we're traveling somewhere, and all of a sudden there was an unscheduled stop. You know, I remember once we were flying to uh, we were we were flying to the Yucatan Peninsula for a mission trip, and we were supposed to fly into Houston, but Houston's airport was flooded, so we ended up in Newark, which is always a thrill. And we ended up spending an unscheduled night in Newark, and I'm like, why are we here? Well, how many of you, when you travel, if you're staying in a hotel for one night, how many of you unpack your suitcase into the dresser? Anybody? I, I, I kind of do sometimes, too. Um, how many of you would unpack for two nights? Three nights? Four nights? Five night, Yeah, eventually you get to the point where you're like, I can't live out of my suitcase anymore. And when we first went into quarantine and this pandemic first started, remember that? Back in March, we were like, by the end of April, this will all be over. And so we spent quite a bit of time living out of our suitcase. The church of Jesus Christ and we as Christians cannot live out of our suitcases for the next three months or four months. We have to start even more asking questions about how do we do this months. I just want to send that out because I think that's an important question to ask. Because the call to make disciples, is that on hold? Did Jesus say, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, name of the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age, except during the pandemic. Then you should just kind of hunker down and stay in your house and be scared of everybody. Now again, some of us need to stay in our house. All of us need to be wise. This is not a do stupid things in the name of Christ thing. It's a do things in the name of Christ. It's make disciples now. In fact, if there's anything that's true, it's that a whole lot of people are asking questions right now, right? And so we need to make disciples. Now, I had you pull your phone out. And um, here's what I want you to do. Pull your phone out and uh, oh, that's sad. My phone's in my office. Okay. we've been asking ourselves, what do we need to do as a church during the pandemic? One of the things we want to do is every time somebody shows up for church, we want them to feel welcome. Now, I know we can't normally do the greeting thing, the handshaking thing, but we need somebody by the door. We need to have somebody by the door every week that's welcoming people and saying, hey, we're glad you're here. If you Now, I know we used to rotate everybody through that. We're not going to do that anymore. Because some of you hate that. And honestly, some of you probably aren't very good at it because you're like, that's not me. But some of you are like, yeah, I kind of like showing up 10 minutes early and saying hi to people and smiling. It just happens naturally. If you would like to be a greeter, I want you to text the word greet to that number. Greet, G-R-E-E-T, to that number. 
Now, we also have a problem because one of the main ways we grow is through classes and groups. And a lot of people are saying, oh, I was in a group and now the group's not meeting. If we have people that want to do it, we can make groups work. Maybe we come and we sit in the library far away from each other or the choir room. Maybe we, you know, have people on Zoom. If you would like to be in a group or at least find out more about a group, text the word group to that number. I love technology in this way. Um, some of you like to go on Facebook. I'm not going to... And, and if you're kind of into Facebook and you'd like to be kind of our part of our Facebook team where we just basically try to share things and like things, and you don't, if you're on Facebook a lot anyway, this will require no time. But if you'd like to kind of be part of the Facebook team, I want you to text the word Facebook to that number. Okay? We're trying to figure out ways that we can reach our community. Not after the pandemic, but now. And we need some people to kind of, that will get together and talk about how we can impact our community now. If you, if that kind of gets you excited, now you're not volunteering for anything at this point other than just being part of the thinking team and talking team. If you really care about reaching our community, especially in the pandemic, I want to have you text the word community to that number. And now, in theory, on my computer, there's all this information popping up. Some of you will get um, some texts back. Some of you won't. Um, and those texts th that are return texts may come from a different number. Don't worry about that. But... Uh, you can fill them out if you want. But here's what it comes down to. Jesus called us to be one so that we can make disciples. Jesus called us to be loving to each other, but also to the people around us. I want to tell you, there's, it's been exciting for me. In the midst of the pandemic, a lot of churches are struggling, and that's sad. Financially, we're doing okay. And so, you know, people are like, oh, don't say that. People will stop giving. You know what? what? I want to challenge you. If your finances have not been taken a hit from the pandemic, would you be willing to maybe say, hey, you know what? I'm going to up my giving a little bit because I want to, Thorn Creek to have the resources to make a difference. What if in the midst of a pandemic, all of a sudden our community, the people we live with, work with, and play with, said, you know what? Thorn Creek was there. I just want to ask you where you want to be part of this. Now, I want to invite the worship team up, and we're going to sing a closing song. And uh, this is a new song to Thorn Creek Reformed Church. Um, it's called Build Your Kingdom Here. Biblically, the, the kingdom of God is anywhere that God's reign. I mean, he's king everywhere, okay? There's no sense in which you make Jesus king. <laughs> he is already. But anywhere that people are living it out and that the reign and kingship of Christ is really being lived out, that's the kingdom. Jesus said, I pray that they may be one that the world may know. In other words, Jesus said, Father, build your kingdom here. So let's stand and sing this together.
That's our prayer, and it's going to start when we are bound by the gospel and nothing else, and nothing divides that. Go in peace, love one another, and love everyone in your life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.